introduce myself. I'm Jess Cutler. I'm a fur ambassador, and I'm going to be uh, taking you through the course this morning. My background is I'm a, a co-founder of Constructability, which is a peer-to-peer -peer network for disabled people in the construction sector, which is something that me and a, and a few other people launched at the end of last year. And I've been helping with the supply chain schools sort of outreach on disability issues, I guess, through the FUR programme over the last year or so. This morning, I'd like you to do, and what we're going to do together is look at invisible disabilities. So what I'd like you to do is give me lots of feedback and lots of questions. I think the best way that we can collectively understand invisible disabilities is probably through question and answer. It may well be that I don't have the answers. It may well be I'm not, certainly not an expert in all of the different variables and varieties of invisible disabilities that, that exist out there. And, and indeed, that's not really the point of this morning. The point of this morning is to understand, I think, how invisible disabilities can affect the working environment and the social environment around people with invisible disabilities. So let's get started. We're going to be taking it right from the beginning at pretty high level. The, the, at the end and throughout, I will try and signpost some other resources which will allow you to get more in, into the detail of, of some of the issues that we're going to raise this morning. What we're going to do, hopefully, is these five things. So what do we mean by the term invisible disability? We want to try and understand that a bit. We want to identify a number of common conditions. And I think really what I'm talking about there is common symptoms as much as common conditions. We want to appreciate some of the benefits of employing people with invisible disabilities. That's really, really important to, to the FER programme, to me, to constructability to, to this whole issue around disability awareness through fur is that that we think as much about the benefits as as to managing the issues so we'll look at that and we also we'll look at the equalities act just to make sure we know where the legal basis for some of this stuff comes from and finally where you can get some more help so this is not a legal definition of uh, disability. This is a definition, a working definition, which I think is, is useful for us today. And it comes from the Invisible Disability Association. So it's a physical, mental or neurological condition, which is not visible from the outside, but it can limit or challenge a person's movement, senses or activities. So it's all fairly straightforward, fairly easy to define, but obviously by its very nature, you can't see it. So you can't tell when you interact with somebody, whether they've got an invisible disability or not. I think you can break it down in a number of ways. So you can either think of it as, as there being physical, mental or neurological conditions, or you can think of it as people with sensory impairments, people with health impairments, or people with cognitive issues. And we'll come back to those three headings in a short while, and we'll look in a bit more detail at, about some of the common symptoms in each of those buckets, and what some of the impacts of those symptoms are in terms of how people with those impairments and those symptoms need to change behaviours, change the environment around them to remove the impairment as much as possible. So, uh, I mean, I've just put these numbers in. It's always useful to, to provide some context to these issues or to the issue of disability. One in five people are actually disabled in the UK and 3.7 million disabled people work. So there's an awful lot of disabled people and there's an awful lot of disabled people in work. And it's always worth bearing that in mind because it tends to be seen as a minority and it is still a minority, one in five, probably a lot more people than necessarily we appreciate. The next 
stat about only 8% of disabled people using a wheelchair, I think is really illustrative of the challenge that invisible disability faces. So, you know, that kind of means that for every person that you come across in a wheelchair, there's 11 other people with a disability that you may or may not have noticed. Many of them have actually got invisible disabilities. So just sort of dwell on that for a short while. Just think you know, it's much more prevalent than perhaps you think. The other couple of points there relate to the fact that many disabilities, in fact, develop while people are working. So you could have people working for you that aren't disabled right now, but could well be by the time they've been with you for a number of years because they're getting older or because of the nature of the disease and health impairments means that they come about later in people's lives. Final point, 9% of the construction workforce will declare a disability. That's encouraging actually, in as much as that number is has gone up a lot since a few years ago when disclosure about disability was a real issue in the construction sector. I suspect that number is still underrepresented to the real number of people, but at, at 9%, at least people do seem to be talking, talking a little bit more openly about disability and asking for help. That's really what ultimately we want people with visible or invisible disabilities to be doing is asking for help, feeling that it's a safe enough space to do that. And again, we'll touch on that a bit later. Okay, so I said we'd come back to the, to the buckets and here's the sensory impairments. So sensory impairments, what are they? What are some of the issues that we might then consider when we're coming into contact when we're interacting with people with these kind of impairments. So the sensory impairments are very, very common and very easy to, to understand. And they're ones that we're all quite familiar with, I would suggest. Issues to be aware of, I think, is that there's a great deal of variety in these impairments, ranging from fairly, fairly, fairly mild to complete loss. And, and obviously the needs will vary uh, depending on the severity of these conditions. It can be progressive. That's always something that can be an issue with, with any disability, but particularly I think invisible disabilities where there comes a point where the invisible disability has a, an effect beyond what the individual can cope with, with their current environment and their current setup and things need to change. The impact for the employer there is the need to keep reassessing needs and keep reassessing the adjustments that are being made and not just to just think that a one time assessment of need and one time cycle of adjustments will see that person through their working time with you it probably won't i think the other point about sensory impairments is the point that they can be easily hidden um, and is that a good thing uh, i would say not as, as i say it people will or may need or benefit from reasonable adjustments if they're hiding their impairment from the employer then those reasonable adjustments are unlikely to be made. And if they're hiding their impairment from their employer, then you've got to be asking why they're doing that. There'll be a number of factors. It's not possible to, to go through them all now, but one of the reasons could be their beliefs that, that they're going to be treated fairly or not. When or should they disclose? How's that disclosure going to be received? And Again, we'll touch on that slightly later on. So health impairments, there's a huge, huge range of health impairments, and I'm not at all going to attempt to go through them all, but some of the common ones, and, and there was a question here about mental health, actually. So mental health 
and physical health I've put together on this slide. So mental health is very much an invisible disability, but we're going to concentrate probably more on the physical health in terms of the symptoms. So the common symptoms of invisible disabilities around health are a debilitating amount of pain. Obviously can't see that, but the person could be in constant pain. Pain could vary from, from activity to activity, from time to time, for any number of different reasons. Fatigue is a very common symptom as of health impairments and dizziness is certainly up there as well. It can be. So the types of common conditions that I've put on this slide, arthritis, encephalitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, multiple sclerosis. They may well all be health conditions or diseases that we've heard of. We may not know too much about them. And again, I'm not going to go through them in, in great detail today or any detail today. What I will do is say the person that knows most about those is the person that has that condition and they are the best person to tell you as the employer all you need to know about that condition. Whether they will or not comes back down to how comfortable they feel, you can make them feel and how safe a space you can create for them. If you want to educate yourself about those conditions, the best place to go, I'd say, is the Remploy website. And Remploy has got some fantastic one or two page uh, summary sheets on just about every invisible disability that, that you can think of. So issues for health impairments, they can be relapsing and remitting. So the most classic one would be multiple sclerosis where it varies from time to time. It, it's always there, but uh, uh, some of the, the impacts are only felt chronically for a short amount of time, but they're not there all the time. I think the point about the behaviors and environment need and changing I've, I've made before. The symptoms, again, of, just to re-emphasize this point, with health impairments, just with sensory impairments, is unlikely to be stability in many of these conditions. They're either relapsing or remitting, as I've said, or they could be progressive, in which case they're, by definition, they're, they're always getting worse. And regular reviews of those person's needs is very, very important in order to meet the reasonable adjustment requirement that as employers, we all have. Cognitive issues and cognitive issues are either because of neurological conditions or because of physiological conditions. And, and classic ones would be dyslexia, autism, and ADHD. A lot of people use the term neurodiverse these days. Neurodiverse is it's quite a useful way of thinking about it because it, it removes the need to think about them as two separate buckets. I think that the most important, from a construction point of view, the most uh, striking thing with cognitive issues and neurodiverse issues is that they are well represented in the construction sector, but not equally represented across all of the construction sector. So they are very well represented in the physical end of the construction sector. So on the site with, with site op operatives and people working physically where perhaps people with those kind of conditions can be, can feel that their disability is less of an, a hindrance or less of a, a, an issue for them to, to manage They're much less represented in the management and, and senior roles where the day-to-day -day skills that they need may be challenged by the impairments that they've got. Many of these conditions are undiagnosed and they can result in unexpected behaviours. At the very high level, that's what I wanted to share is those three areas and thinking about what's common in those three areas.
and what as employers we need to to do about it and i think the two things that come through constant review and creating a, a safe space why you want to do that is because you want to employ more disabled people and why do you want to employ more more disabled people you can think of it i think in three different ways there is no doubt in my mind that disabled people bring a resilience and creativity to their work tasks that they've that they have in buckets loads of because they've had to and they constantly have to overcome social environmental barriers in their day-to-day -day life that they're just so used to working creatively around issues that are put in their path and quite frankly they never give up so they'll bring those skills to the workforce future success means getting your talent pool as broad as you possibly can and disabled people again if you cut them out of your workforce by not having a safe space and not setting up the mechanisms around uh, supporting disabled people that you need to the constant review the reasonable adjustments then you're not going to get people with disabilities applying to work for you and then you're missing out on a skill set and you're missing out on a big chunk of the potential employee ease which you may need and you will need for future success and finally there is an argument about reflecting the community around you um, and your workforce should be reflective of the community around you to increase your social value so just then final thoughts about the legal side of things and then we'll, we'll go on and we'll we'll get to some questions this is the legal definition of being disabled if you have a physical or mental impairment that has a substantial and long-term adverse impact on your ability to carry out normal day-to-day -day activities so i've highlighted three terms there substantial long-term and normal day-to-day -day activities um, so long-term typically 12 months substantial isn't really well defined you know that's one for the lawyers unfortunately normal day-to-day -day activities are not work related they are getting dressed brushing your teeth walking breathing feeding yourself those kind of activities rather than work related ones so the bar for defining yourself as disabled is is quite high in that respect so how does that impact then on invisible disabilities i break it down into sort of there being three implications of the equalities act and now i don't discriminate don't ask and make reasonable adjustments and that very simple way of thinking about the qualities act when it comes to treating disabled people or people with uh, impairments there are seven at least different types of discrimination that that you can identify and the associate the online learning on invisible disabilities that's also that's up on the school website goes through those very very nicely actually i encourage you if you're interested to go and have a look at that because it's quite sobering to sit and, and look at the seven different ways that you can discriminate and look at your own behaviors and see how easily inadvertently you can be thinking in or applying yourself in a way which has the potential to discriminate discrimination in broad senses is treating people less favorably and critically it applies to the complete hr cycle so it applies from the point at which you're trying to attract somebody to the organization right through to the point in which they leave your organization uh, for whatever reason don't ask so there is no requirement of a person with disability to inform or to tell you that they have a disability and in many cases 
it's best to assume that you shouldn't ask them. And there are exceptions to that, but in simple terms, it's best to assume that you don't ask. That, in other words, the person with the disability needs to ask for help rather than for you to ask them about their disability. So you need to make them feel comfortable enough and feel safe to ensure that they do come to you and ask for help. I would strongly recommend looking at disability confidence for ways in which you can do that. There's a link on the school website for that. And there are other resources as well that, that can help you do that, that I'll touch on in the end. The third point is to make reasonable adjustments. So you do have that duty. So the adjustment should, as far as possible, reduce the substantial disadvantage that the person has. So what does that mean? So if a person is struggling to, with an invisible, if a person is struggling with an invisible disability, that means that they have a lot of fatigue, then that's their substantial disadvantage. So allowing flexible working would substantially or could substantially mitigate that condition. So that would be a reasonable adjustment. So let's have a look at reasonable adjustments in, in a bit more detail. Yes, so as I said, the law says that you have a duty to make a reasonable adjustment. The consequence of not making that reasonable adjustment means that, that you could find that your employee takes you to an employment tribunal. You could be in that place. And our employment tribunals are public and the outcomes are public at least. So your reputation is at risk if you find yourself in that situation. So in practice, so that should mitigate the substantial disadvantage. Again, to reiterate, it's the employer's responsibility, not the employee's, to identify the adjustments, but you have to get the employee to ask for help or to tell you about the, what adjustments they need. So that's where the, the openness comes in. That's where the creating a safe space comes in. And I've touched on this before. They may well be more than one set of adjustments that you need to make. Almost certainly more than one set of adjustments that you need to make throughout the HR cycle that you have with one person with a disability. I like to think of reasonable adjustments as in a sort of hierarchical triangle. And I've got this list the wrong way around on purpose to, to illustrate that. So actually you want to start from five and work your way down to one in terms of when you're thinking about reasonable adjustments. The adjustments that almost every single invisible disability will require, will, certainly when you'll probably want to start your thinking about making reasonable adjustments, will be around the policies that you set for, for work. You know, we talked about flexible working as a policy shift, which you may need to make to allow people with invisible disabilities, the reasonable adjustments that they need to get rid of their substantial disadvantage. That then feeds through to the change in the way that line managers interact with that disabled person, which is a set of behaviors. How well is that policy understood? How well is that understood as it applies to disabled people or that disabled person. And then above and beyond that level of understanding, does that person then need anything else, anything physical? With invisible, just, just because the disability is invisible doesn't mean that they don't sometimes need physical support. You think of people with sensory impairments, certainly need physical support you know, whether that's reading software, so speaking software, so that um, things on the screen can be read out loud, that kind of thing. Once you've exhausted those possibilities, is there any process changes that you need to think about to accommodate people with invisible disabilities? So what are we talking about there? We're talking about people changing their locations, their work locations, changing their potentially 
changing their role as you review their, if you keep their work constant review, you could start thinking about changing the job function to better suit that person's disability or to better suit the ability of that person um, by rearranging how the job of work is done. That's a more complicated reasonable adjustments, but it, it can fall under the need to make change. It can be a reasonable adjustment. And the final thing is to make physical changes to the workplace. That's less likely, but not impossible to be a requirement for an invisible disability as well. Although that tends to be more of a requirement if it's a visible disability where, where people have access issues. So let's leave it there and get into some questions. Final slide that I would just bring up, and I saw somebody talked about this earlier on, is, is access to work. Access to work is a fantastic resource, and it's a great way of helping the employer and the employee fund. This is why it's great, because it does provide cash to get support. So I think the issue that probably most resonates with this sort of what we're talking about this morning is is when we're looking at understanding access to work can help you provide disability awareness training to people that the disabled person works with or that you're working with and it can also provide you know interpreters for sign language and things like that so that's quite useful so right apologies i'm distracted by the questions let's get into some of those questions now and then we'll just look at at what's next so this is a question from hannah how do you advise to tackle gender specific issues like endometriosis in a male centric industry to encourage empathy and understanding that's a great great question that isn't a question that, that's limited to any one condition that that's about i think generally about making yourself as the employer aware of the condition and i would say yes go back to the resources that are available as a first step go and look on the reemploy site find out about what it means to live with that condition i think the point about you know some conditions are more prevalent in males and some conditions are more prevalent in females some conditions you only get when you're older some conditions you can have throughout your life it requires the ability to put yourself in somebody else's shoes and that's that point about empathy how you do that i think it's about exposure i think it's about being brave enough to sit and think about how these conditions can impact on people's lives throughout the whole of their lives rather than just their working life. So what do I mean by that? I mean, treating that person as a human and thinking with empathy about that person as, a, as another human to understand some of the difficulties that they have and that, that they, they will go through. There's a great model, which we haven't talked about today, which is the medical versus social model of disability and if you want to know more about that then just type in or google social model of disability in your your website and it sort of gets to the this issue i think which is that disabilities are only disabilities are inflicted by the environment and the society with which that person exists and they're not medical issues that need to be treated but they are impairments that are placed on that person because the physical environment doesn't suit their abilities and the social environment discriminates against their impairments and now those are the two things that you need to remove okay so there's a question about access to work. So we have used access to work when a member of staff became increasingly impaired by sight loss. And they were very helpful in signposting what equipment we could use 
and invest in. Okay, yeah, so this is confirmation about how access to work is a good source of information. They did help that they were one of the office-based staff. If they were in a site, it would probably have been impossible. And it's a hard choice, but a lot of the adjustments we can make are easier to resolve if not outside. Yeah, I think that's a fair call. A lot of the reasonable adjustment examples that you, that you see are based for people that work in an office, that people that work certainly inside. I think there's space, no doubt, and it's actually something that constructability might take away, is that what do reasonable, what can reasonable adjustments look like when you're working outside? I mean, there are some limits to that. One of the things that, that, that we didn't get into when we were looking at the impacts of the Equalities Act was the in the don't ask section is that there is a basic requirement of having the ability to do the job and if the job is a physical job then a phys person with a physical disability might not be suited to it. That's fairly easy and fairly simple to understand and to work through. It's an area where you can, when it's essential to the role, you can ask the question because you are seeking to qualify somebody for the role. So how does that apply with individual disabilities? It's slightly less clear. So if you take anxiety, for example, a, a mental health condition, and you think of perhaps what I'm doing now, speaking publicly, is it possible for somebody with a high level of anxiety to do a public speaking role? Yes, it is with training and with the right level of support, if that's what they want to do. So you shouldn't disqualify somebody from doing that role. And the same would apply to roles outside with invisible disabilities. So you take the, the sensory loss, for example, a full or high degree of sensory impairments doesn't prevent somebody from working outside. It's not essential for them to be able to have a full set of sensory impairments for them to work on a construction site. So there is then a need to make reasonable adjustments. And that's likely to be around some of the health and safety warnings at the very least that you'd need to put in place. I, I think that's something to take away and look at where else you can get information about that. Okay, that's an interesting question. Just mindful of the time. Just this final question and, that we'll touch on and then we'll draw it to a close. But if you keep someone's job under review due to their disability, isn't that itself discrimination? If you're not applying the same criteria to able-bodied staff? It depends. I mean, the answer to that, I think, is is no. It's it's not that you're keeping the, the job under review. It's that you're keeping the reasonable adjustments under review. And because you have a legal duty to provide those reasonable adjustments, then that duty only applies if the person is disabled. So you don't have to do that and for everyone. So, so in that sense, it's it's not discrimination, but, but it's a fair challenge that to avoid discrimination, you are treating people differently. Discrimination doesn't mean treating people equally. It means not treating people with a protected characteristics less favorably, which is not the same as treating people equally. Okay, let's, let's leave it there. Thank you for listening. Thanks for the questions. There's an awful lot of questions in there that we didn't get through. What I propose to do is just to have a look at those now and, and perhaps find a way of getting back to you all individually with, with answers. Apologies, we didn't get through them all. It says to me that there's a big demand for this, which is great. And we'll have a look at those questions and, and see it might be that some kind of follow-up is needed as a webinar format or at the very least I'll get back to you one-on-one -on -one to answer your questions. So more resources 
just quickly as, as we leave. There are more fur training coming up. The resources that I talked about, Disability Confident and the, some of the Remploy stuff is available through the Supply Chain School website in the first section of the Supply Chain School website. So do look at those. These are things that you'll all be familiar with anyway, because you're all Supply Chain School members. So there is a lot of fur resource on the site in terms of case studies and resources and so on that some of those do touch on disability issues and yeah so that's it and good luck <laughs>